everyone, and welcome to our special program um, in honor of Martin Luther King and the 40 Days of Peace. Um, today, we're really privileged to have three notables uh, as part of our webinar. And this particular webinar is being broadcast live right now on the Charter for Compassion Facebook page. And in addition, it is also going to a number of other organizations through the SIGN network. So hopefully our audience will be very large today. Um, the three people that we're going to hear from today um, are Dr. Clay Carson, Dr. Michael Nagler, and Manda Apti. And let me give you just a little bit of background about the three people before we begin. Uh, Dr. Carson has been a professor at Stanford University for over 40 years, where he primarily teaches U.S. history and African American history. Dr. Carson has taught and lectured around the world, especially in Britain, France, China, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, and throughout the United States. He teaches and lectures about Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Black Panther Party, and other subjects related to the Black struggle and civil rights. In 1985, Coretta Scott King asked Dr. Carson to lead a project in publishing Dr. King's previously unpublished works. Dr. Carson and his staff have spent 20 years working to edit and publish Dr. King's works. Um, I was really fascinated when um, I found out a little bit more about Dr. Carson. And early in my life, uh, when I, the first year after I graduated college, I went off to work with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And before long, found myself in Mississippi uh, working uh, on voters' rights, but more involved in um, the Meredith March against fear. And for, I, I think it was eight to 10 days, I got the incredible privilege of hearing every evening uh, the leaders who were on that march. Um, Dr. King, certainly, Stokely Carmichael, um, Andrew Young, Jesse Jackson. But the most important thing, um, I think during those days was the discussion um, about nonviolence uh, and about what was happening in the South and particularly at that moment, what was happening in the March um, and the fear that many of us uh, felt. And it was during this time that Stokely Carmichael gave his very um, important speech on, on black power and so in reading uh, about Dr. Carson, I understand your very intimate involvement um, with this, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, and I'm excited to, to hear from you today. Dr. Michael Nagler uh, is Professor Emeritus of Classics and Comparative Literature at UC Berkeley, where he founded the Peace and Conflict Studies Program and taught upper division courses on nonviolence, meditation, and a seminar on the meaning of life. He's the president of, and founder, I believe, of the Meta Center for Nonviolence and author of The Search for a Nonviolent Future, The Nonviolent Handbook, and to be published in March, The Third Harmony, Nonviolence, and the New, New Story of Human Nature. He's also co-host of Nonviolence Radio and the Nonviolence Report. He has spoken for the UN and in fact, uh, another connection, uh, we, we shared space in India in August uh, at a UNESCO Martin uh, Mahatma Gandhi Education Institute uh, conference. Um, and he's also been involved in speaking with the US Institute for peace and many academic and public ventures for over 30 years. And he's the winner of the prestigious 
Jamala Bajaj International Award for promoting Gandhian values outside India. Mandar Apti is well known to us because he's on the Charter for Compassion board. Um, and he's the executive director from India with Love, an initiative that he had started in 2016 to reinvigorate the message of nonviolence, ahimsa, in the world. From India um, with Love brought together uh, people from Sandy Hook, a former gang member from LA, Black Lives activist from uh, uh, the Oakland area, to a journey to India, and he made uh, a wonderful film that we provided the link uh, to all of you who uh, registered so that you might see it. And he's also inspired over a thousand schools to host the screening of the film to celebrate the 150th birth year of Mahatma Gandhi. For nearly two decades, uh, Mandar has taught leadership programs using meditation practices for the Art of Living Foundation. And as I mentioned, uh, he has been involved with a number of nonprofit organizations and is visiting scholar at George Mason uh, School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. So before we start, um, Michael, I went to your website and the story that's up there right now, I think is, is really a, a really informative one. Um, and one that, that um, I, I think is a real teaching tool within itself. And so I, I wanted to share that um, with the audience and before we, we go into questions. And uh, Michael writes on the website about Dr. Howard Thurman, uh, who was a well-known figure uh, in the Harlem Renaissance. And he and his wife made a journey to India in 1939 and met with Gandhi. And uh, Mrs. Uh, Thurman was very excited about this meeting and she was encouraged Gandhi to come uh, to the United States because uh, she said, we need you. And um, Gandhi spoke about Shivdesi uh, or localism, and that how important it was to get your own house in order uh, before you almost open the doors to let others to come in. Um, and he said, you know, it may be through the Negroes in the United States, the unadulterated message of nonviolence is delivered to the world. Martin Luther King at that time was seven years old. And so he then made a journey to India, uh, where the connection of these two incredible individuals who never met, uh, but are so linked, uh, became even more powerful and stronger. And in King's own, own words, he said, I am more convinced than ever before that the method of nonviolence resistance is the most potent weapon available to oppressed people in their struggle for justice and human dignity. So that is something I think will um, kind of be the base of, of our talk today or our conversation. Um, and so, you know, what we're concerned about is, you know, Martin Luther King and Gandhi, um, why these two men, uh, the impact that they had on one another. So Michael, what's special about India and the culture and wisdom that was able to produce a Gandhi? Here I am talking about India with Mandar Apte on the call and talking about MLK with Dr. Clay Carson on the call. You have to permit me for being a little bit embarrassed, but uh, I would say, uh, uh, you know, I've been a, a, a pretty thorough student of India's spiritual culture for nigh on to half a century now. And I, I think it's the only civilization in the world that did a continuous systematic study of spiritual life. I, I, I'm Jewish originally, so I'm, I'm reading this book called Meditation and Kabbalah, 
And it struck me forcibly how the Jews had this tremendous uh, spiritual yearning, as we all do as human beings. And the one thing that prevented them from really developing it was uh, the, the, the diaspora, that the temple was destroyed, the people were scattered, and they didn't have that continuity because to express the full meaning of the spiritual nature of reality in a way that people can have access, at least intellectually, to that reality seems to take uh, centuries of uh, refining one's vocabulary, practicing, practicing. And so this is a relative statement, not an absolute statement, but it's, I think we can say that India has probably done the best job of preserving a spiritual culture. And the, of the, there were four basic paths that they laid out for spiritual awareness. Uh, the path of devotion, which is, was a specialty of the Christian religion. The, the path of knowledge. The path of action. And the path of meditation. And I think to, to, I think we could say that before Gandhi, no one had really latched onto the path of action with the intensity and the fullness and the completeness that he had. And the result was that what he showed Dr. King was that Christianity could work. I mean, as uh, Michael Casey, the author of uh, Strangers to the City has pointed out recently, the, the vocabulary of Christianity had been degraded to the point where the religion had hardly any practical significance in solving the bitter problems that we face in life. And, and Gandhi broke through that and said, no, this is exactly how you do it. So I mean, my, my meditation teacher, my spiritual teacher always said that our goal uh, as a community, as an ashram, is to bring together the best of India and the best of the West. And I, I think in a way that comes to a focus in the life of Martin Luther King, because he, you know, he, he got it, he caught what was the best in India's spiritual tradition as a practical tool. Now, I would just say, and I'm probably going on way too long, Marilyn, you can, you know, I, I would just say that um, in reality, Nonviolence goes way beyond the struggle for oppressed people and their struggle for justice. That is perhaps its most dramatic application, but it can actually be applied in any compartment of life because that's, that's the hardest thing I think for us in the West to grasp, that this is an underlying power which, you know, doesn't like, you know, pick up pens and pencils and move things in the physical world but it impacts the, or affects human consciousness. It affects consciousness in general and human consciousness in particular. So it's there for every one of us to use in every situation of life. I think it's critically important to know that oppressed people can, uh, can achieve justice with it in a way that leaves the uh, conflicting parties in friendship, in a relationship. I mean, we like to contrast sometimes the Indian freedom struggle, which, you know, cost the lives of a few thousand people and uh, it achieved freedom it, with the one in Algeria, where almost 10% of the population died in that struggle. And the relationship between the French and the Algerians was very strange, strained, and Algeria does, you know, was a long way towards achieving democracy. Whereas in India, there was only a minuscule portion of the population that actually lost their life. India and uh, Britain are friends, you know, relatively speaking, and there is a democracy there, though it is, you know, struggling under many problems. Uh, but it's such uh, just a vastly more successful outcome. And, and this was long before we had this wonderful book by Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan showing that nonviolent struggles, and she just means struggles without the use of arms. There's not nonviolence in the, 
as a state of mind, as I like to say principled nonviolence is. So those nonviolent struggles are twice as effective as violent ones in one third the time, and they're 10 times more likely to lead to democratic uh, entitlements after it succeeded. So um, I guess I'll stop here. I just want to say that, uh, yeah, nonviolence is, I think, probably the greatest discovery of our century, which we better make. <laughs> right. You know, I, I just want to remind everyone, your microphones are on, and please feel free to engage uh, one another in conversation. Uh, Clay, you know, I, I guess the question that um, looms forth is you've been spending so much time, 20 years, uh, in looking at the writings and speaking. 35 years. Pardon me, how many? 35 years. Since okay, <laughs> I'll be corrected. So that is a very I long time. And so um, what have you noted about um, through the speeches and the writings of King that relate back to what he saw in India? Well, <clears throat> I think first of all, I would say that um, Martin Luther King came gradually, like many of us, through experience to uh, an understanding of nonviolence. It wasn't like he uh, uh, did a deep study of, of Gandhi before uh, going there. He had heard of him, he had read some books, um, and, uh, and I think it largely came through other people. Um, when he began uh, his work in Montgomery, uh, he, he really didn't have uh, a deep understanding of it. Uh, I think it was someone else who actually first identified the Montgomery movement as, as Gandhian. It was a, a woman writing in a newspaper and, and then it kind of, kind of got picked up and I think he probably said, well, people are calling this Gandhi and maybe I, sh I should find out more about it. <laughs> uh, and I think at that point he went back to uh, the books that he had. Um, and he also had people like Baird Rustin and others come to uh, Montgomery and uh, helped him, kind of gave him an advanced uh, accelerated course on, on nonviolence. Um, he was fortunate to have uh, James Lawson, who mm. spent time in India, mm. come uh, to Montgomery and, and advise him. And so I think the major thing was that he, he was open to that, uh, that kind of mentorship. Um, and, and I think that the trip to India was a learning experience for him, for him and for Coretta. Uh, they, they went there uh, with the idea that they were going to uh, study from people who uh, were more experienced than they were. And uh, so I think that by the time you get to the Birmingham campaign, and when he writes the letter from Birmingham jail, you know, by that time he's, he's really thought through a lot of these issues and uh, is able to make that great statement about, uh, about nonviolent resistance. And I think it's also important that sometimes we, we use the term nonviolent without the resistance part. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's unfortunately given nonviolence, I think, a, a, a bad name, you know, in the sense that people who are oppressed don't see it as a tool for getting out of their oppression. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the negation of violence um, rather than the use of nonviolence mm -hmm. uh, tactics to achieve a, a desired goal. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think for many people, and I think this was part of you, uh, Marilyn, when you were mentioning the Black Power March, I think that there was that, that sense that it was, it was a passive resistance to injustice. And if it's simply that, uh, a lot of people who are oppressed have no interest in it. And, uh, you know, so I, I think that part of the problem that I see is that 
often it's presented wrongly mm -hmm. um, so that there is this, uh, you know, it's kind of like retooling your brain to get violence out of it as opposed, as opposed to retooling your brain to understand that nonviolence can be an effective weapon, as, as Michael put it. Uh, you know, I think that that's the harder part. And, uh, and I think that it's un so unfortunate in, in some ways that uh, the people most likely to go into a nonviolence workshop are not people who are oppressed. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, sometimes you have to bring the workshop to the people rather than uh, finding people who are willing to go away for a weekend and, and study nonviolence. Uh, so, so I think that there's, there's a lot that King did to, I think one of the main things he did was to popularize the idea of nonviolent resistance in the United States. And, and that was important for Gandhian ideas because otherwise there would have been this misconception that this is something that might have worked in another country, mm -hmm. but certainly not in a country like the United States. And I think it took a Martin Luther King to prove that, yeah, this can apply uh, in the most powerful nation on, on earth. Um, it's not some mystical Eastern philosophy. It's something that uh, works quite well in uh, the most powerful country. And, uh, and I think that was an important step forward. And I, you know, just like uh, Nelson Mandela and the South African struggle was, I think, uh, an important step toward telling people in different parts of the world this can work in lots of different contexts. It's not just um, for um, privileged people in the United States. It, it can work in, in many different uh, settings, cultural settings, uh, religious settings. And, uh, and I think that that's very important because sometimes it becomes kind of a um, very, you know, it's, it's almost like you're, you're saying that this is something that can only work when you can take time away from regular life and go and study. <laughs> and, uh, and I think, and I think that's one of the things that, uh, uh some of the theorists on, on nonviolence have, have, have done is just kind of done what I've done as a historian. And that is just, don't start with philosophy, just start with history. Look at all the different times in history where nonviolence has, has been effective. And you find that it's lots of different techniques, lots of different religious traditions. That was Truman there. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, lots of different uh, religious traditions, lots of different historical settings. And uh, so I think that that's, uh, that's an important message in itself because uh, sometimes it does get um, that sense that it's only for middle class or you know, privileged uh, white people who can, can go and, and take time out of their lives to study nonviolence. Michael, I see that you want to say something. Thank you, Marilyn. Clay, I, I'd like to get your feedback on this, and, and you too, Madara. Uh, I think that one of the elements of Gandhi's overall program that King uh, didn't have the time to fully develop, but he was on the way there. And I'm happy to say we're only recently catching on to the significance of this, is the element of constructive program, that it can be a powerfully resistant tool to build the things that you need, which the regime is not building for you, your schools, your medical, your health care, you know, your, uh, especially your economy, uh, that can be a powerful dimension of the resistance, of the overall resistance, to show that you're not helpless, you're not dependent on them. And it's only in the last five or so years, I think, that that we who have the privilege of studying nonviolence have begun to really catch on to what a powerful dimension that is. 
I think to add to that, um, one of the things that has come out of the Gandhi King Conference that uh, um, Michael Bandar and others um, came to is the idea of the network. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, it's occurred to me that there are perhaps hundreds of thousands of, of organizations and groups throughout the world that are devoted to making the world a better place. And so the question becomes, why don't they have more power? Mm -hmm. And I think part of it is that they're, they are in their silos uh, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. thinking that they have, each of these groups thinks that <laughs> it has the answer. And, um, and they're really kind of in a competitive uh, world. I, I think of it as venture capitalism for uh, human rights. You know, you want to you want to you want to sell your version of how to solve the world's problems, and and I think that that prevents you from seeing that there are things that if you could bring those several hundred thousand groups into some kind of consciousness where they recognize their collective power, many of the tactics of nonviolence only work at scale, mm -hmm. only work. You know, something like a boycott only works if lots of people do it. Mm -hmm. uh, using economic pressure, uh, developing alternative economies. Uh, you know, all of these things only work if millions of people do it. And so a lot of the, the potential power of, of nonviolent action is, is lost simply because we don't cooperate. We don't we don't have a sense of our collective power. Um, one of the things that uh, Prasad mentions, who some of you know, um, uh, he, uh, he said that whenever I go into a room and ask people, raise your hands if you're in favor of human rights, and everybody raises their hand. And but the question is, why, aren't, why then is it such a feeble concept? Why is it that human rights gets violated every day throughout the world? Um, and we don't have, we don't sense the power to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that part of it is, is that we have to make this into a, a mass movement. Mm -hmm. We have to find ways of getting people to look beyond their particular approaches and and find ways of of mobilizing that collective power. Mm -hmm. you know, just just to take one example, um, there are places in the world that routinely violate human rights. Simply not buying anything or going to those countries or having vacations in those countries and transferring our economic power to countries that do respect human rights is a, is a powerful weapon in itself. And uh, we've seen those kinds of, you know, the, the great boycott for farm workers, uh, uh, the, all the economic pressure that was put on South Africa by people throughout the world. You know, that's, that's what really can work in the modern world. And we have the technological tools to do that. We're using one of them right now. Right. <laughs> uh, but we, we, I think, fail to understand that um, we, we have to find ways of crossing the boundaries of religion, philosophies, uh, class, you know, all of those kinds of things that keep us in our, our separate silos. Right. You know, at the Charter, we say that we're a network of networks and we're constantly trying to, you know, build bridges um, across the silos. And I think that Mandar's project um, has certainly been one of those efforts of, um, and that he's put together. And so Mandar, I, I think that I'd like to ask you, um, and I, I see that what you're doing is a historical tactic to a certain extent because so many people don't understand either uh, the work 
uh, of Martin Luther King or of Gandhi don't understand as, as we've been talking about um, the full holistic nature of, um, of nonviolence and resistance. Um, and so I'm going to ask um, the, uh, Mandar if you could talk a bit about uh, that first journey that you took uh, to India, uh, which was to take Martin Luther King's 30 days, bring them down to 10 days, um, and to have people experience that, that same um, innovative and experiential learning that happened with Coretta Scott King and Martin Luther King. Uh, Marilyn, uh, I am firstly just in awe at what we heard in the first 30 minutes from these two legends. So I am so grateful for their time and their work. Uh, it's just an honor. Like, uh, you know, whatever Clay is saying, I'm saying yes, yes, yes. We need that network of networks, you know. So I'm an engineer by profession and I used to run the innovation practice for a small oil company. And so I'm looking at this from uh, two lenses, one corporate innovation and peace activism. Because, you know, like Clay and Michael both have referred to, there is an economy of peace, the economies of uh, peace. And that requires us to come together to be a collective and only, only then our voice is heard. I love these thoughts. I think, uh, you know, the future of the artificial intelligence uh, can be used to make these connections. So my, my, my neurons are just firing based on what uh, these two people have said. But going back four years, this, this week, four years ago, uh, I was reading uh, Dr. King's uh, autobiography that uh, was edited by Clay. And I was on a holiday in India for a month. And I read this uh, 30 pages, roughly 30 pages of uh, a chapter called Pilgrimage to India. And I had no idea about this journey to India that uh, this uh, legendary uh, you know, person uh, had made. Because in India, we don't get exposed to uh, civil rights history or you know, Martin Luther King's activism. Uh, so for me, it was a discovery, like, wow. And so I then checked whether he went by boat, like, you know, why would he go away for five weeks? But no, he had gone by plane. So he actually physically spent four to five weeks in the land of India. And, you know, the second discovery I had was Gandhi and King never had a Starbucks conversation together <laughs> that, hey, buddy, tell me, how did you do it? Right? That for me was the big discovery, like, wow. So something happened in India was my hypothesis. And then I started, you know, putting together a concept that the word nonviolence, what does it mean, ahimsa, that not many people know, ahimsa. And when you break the Sanskrit word ahimsa, what does that mean? It means a lack of violence. The discovery of what is lack of violence ends you to think of peace, but that's not enough. Love, but that's not enough. Unconditional love. So that was my theory. Like ahimsa is unconditional love. And when you come to that state of mind that Michael is talking about, that consciousness of this unconditional love complex, you're, uh, you know, you're blossomed into not thinking about me, me, mine, but we, we, ours. So you start relating to everything around you, start feeling a sense of belonging to everything around you. And all your actions, behaviors, thoughts come from that state of, I belong to the world. So now this was my discovery. I had read the book. I knew the, you know, this world of Ahimsa. Uh, and I felt like, there is a time to make another journey where we bring the victims of violence because in the US where I reside, we have become immune to violence because there is so much that yet another school incident, we look at it, we put flowers and candles and talk, but then we sadly move on. And so that was my like 
key moment of action like non violence needs to have action it cannot just be uh, you know sit and cry and so that when i challenged myself that i am in india already let me see if i can put my time in bringing victims of violence and uh, that film uh, was produced in that one month vacation and it changed my life because when you spend time with you know victims of violence you start relating to that man this can happen to me this can happen in my neighborhood school and uh, i think that is that was my wake up call that the time i had holding these you know six brave individuals who took my call answered and spoke to me on facetime and zoom came to india in a 10 day uh, time period so i honor them because they not only you know accepted the invite but it transformed me as a person and what happens when you travel in india michael uh, will relate to it is when you go to the rural parts of india where uh, you can see humanity that is not uh, tainted with modern you know exposure to privilege you see unconditional love you see people sharing their food with you even if they don't have it you see people uh, doing acts of service as if it's their nature and duty and that's what i think happen happens to anybody who goes to india is that is spirituality spirituality is beyond religion it is our human nature and so when you get exposed to that humanity i think that is when we wake up that is when i woke up that wow we we need to reinvigorate this humanity and so that for me was uh, you know martin luther king's uh, unknown little known journey to india that uh, uh, we have to now uh, think what did he learn and uh, those are many discoveries that uh, you know we can make when you study non violence as a yogic principle that uh, it is not sitting idle and sitting uh, you know without any action but it is preparing your mind and consciousness so that you can act with full understanding around you and one more thing i will say in people think about non violence but michael will agree i'm sure michael has also studied the same principles that i have studied through my teacher non violence is at three levels thoughts speech and action most people get consumed by action but the indian philosophy of ahimsa starts with thoughts because when you do not have bad thoughts or negative thoughts then violence drops away from your speech and action and so that is where we need to use the ancient principles of yoga breathing exercises meditation practices reflection prayer to make sure that our thoughts are in a state of ahimsa because once you guard your thought then speech and action becomes very powerful i think that is the power that uh, dr king had is every speech you hear you have charged it's like he is charging you with uh, you know valor and courage which is the uh, the the power you need to to resist without that inner power i think it's uh, just it will dilute itself so i believe that non violence starts with having this mindset of unconditional love and the power of my speech and action which is a personal journey it is a self discovery so i would love to hear if michael has any resonance with uh, you know my hypothesis and my theory <laughs> so, surprisingly i i do have a, a bit uh there there is a theory which i like therefore i think it's true that uh etymologically you know you dig into the root meaning of the word ahimsa it actually doesn't mean the absence of harm but rather the absence of the intention to harm the absence of the desire to harm because when you use the word thought mandar it in in that sense it includes every kind of uh perturbation in the mind you know yeah. whether it be a desire plan and intention all of that has to be coming from an energy of love yeah. uh for the perfect vehicle of ahimsa 
Uh, there is a story that, and I, I, I've never been able to completely verify this. Maybe you have a, a sense on this, Clay, that when Martin Luther King was in Mani Bhavan in Mumbai, where Gandhi used to go when he was in that city, uh, he insisted on spending the night in Gandhi's room, yeah. which was completely mm -hmm. against the rules. Yeah. <laughs> and, and when he came down in the morning, he, he said, now I can go back to my country and do my work so there was a there was a, a literally a spiritual transmission that that happened at that moment now uh if i could go just back a little bit to what you both were saying about oh in fact you also marilyn about the need for a uh, collaboration of some kind to manifest the collective power that's slumbering away within all of these hundreds of thousands of organizations. What we've been doing at the Meta Center, we, we have two ways of approaching this. One is we've developed a model called Roadmap, uh, which kind of lays out how a little bit about how that collaboration could work. <laughs> Here's a picture of Roadmap here. It's on our website. The other thing that we've been doing uh, more more recently is digging down to the underlying narrative, which we don't articulate, but which determines how we look at the world and, and other beings and our purpose in the world. And this effort is sometimes called the new story. It grows out of spirituality on the one hand and, and new science on the other. You know, when Greta Thunberg says, trust the science, I take that to mean trust the new science also, the discovery of mirror neurons and quantum theory and all the rest of it. And um, to make a deliberate effort, I think, in our time to rebuild that narrative into a more realistic and far more optimistic image of who we are and what we can accomplish. I think that would affect everybody on this whole network, Clay, you know, of all these hundreds and thousand things that Paul Hawken talks out, what talks about whether you're trying to save the whales or end militarism or get voting rights. It's all coming from that new quote unquote image of who we are of human beings. And the fact that uh, nonviolence makes such a direct contribution to the elevation of human dignity no matter how you use it, and no matter whether you win or lose, quote unquote, in your struggle, it makes that powerful contribution. That is why it is so essential and, and why I think it was King himself who said the choice is no longer between violence and nonviolence, it's between nonviolence and non-existence. Yes. I, th I think that one of the things I would add to your, uh, what both of you are saying is that um, perhaps because I'm sitting here in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. I, I do think that um, a lot of the ultimate answer to these, these kinds of questions about how do we prepare people to live in a new kind of world is that we have to use technology. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's no other choice that, that we have this miracle and it is something that even 50 years ago, it would have seemed miraculous that I could uh, talk to somebody in, in India at no cost for as long as I want, just pick up my phone and talk. And, and I, I do it often. Um, you know, that, that would have been inconceivable and, uh, half a century ago. So we, we make a mistake when we think that we have to bring, you know, make education kind of the small group activity. I think that's one of the things that schools have, I, uh, problems I have with schools is that the model of the school is you bring everyone into a classroom and somehow education happens there. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that the new kind of education for our century is it comes into your home. It comes into your room. It comes into your head 
mm. you know it's it's in your it's in your cell phone mm. uh you know i when i when i want to brush up on my spanish i go to my cell phone i don't mm. go to a classroom i don't take a class mm. when i, when I want to find an answer to some technological problem you know just for example how to build this network i get on the i i took a class on network building, mm. uh, taught at the University of Chicago. Mm. And so I think that we have the ability to bring lessons, education. You know, the, the part, part of the untold story of, of the mass movement we had in the United States um, during the 50s and 60s were things like Islander, uh, the citizenship education programs, uh, the freedom schools in Mississippi, you know, that, that was not traditional education. That was bringing education to people where they are. Uh, sometimes you have to bring them to a centralized location and that's what the Highland School or the citizenship education schools were, is that, but you, you make an effort to bring ordinary people there. And I'm sure that the that if Dorothy Cotton were still here and, and running the citizenship education schools, uh, she would be saying, yeah, we should we should have that online. We should have that so that everybody could get access to it. And and this this kind of education, I think, really needs to start at the grammar school level. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we created at the Institute was the liberation curriculum idea. And the basic idea, you know, we, we do it, I wouldn't say we, we, we do it all very effectively, as effectively as it can be done, but the basic idea is to make education freely available and readily available to anybody in the world at any age. And I think beyond building in the network, building the educational program that would go on the network is probably most important. And there I, I, I think it's very important that we find out what are the commonalities in our approaches? You know, what are the things about the TED Talks? You know, I've done one and you know, all that, but it's, it's again, it's kind of a competitive activity whose TED talk gets the most hits. And, and that's often who's the charismatic person who can deliver a message, you know. And, and charisma is, is not something I would dismiss, but it often isn't connected to, um, you know, King's charisma was important because it reached a vast audience. Um, and right now I think that what we need I'm kind of using the metaphor of King's World House. You know, he talked about the World House as this place where people of all different cultures and you know, backgrounds uh, could somehow learn to live together. You know, and he put it in the book, Chaos of Community. And I think to follow up on Michael's comment, you know, that, that was his choice. You know, we have, we'll either build a global community or we're gonna have chaos. And so then the, the basic question for our age is what lessons do human beings need to learn in order to live in this world house? And if we can just address that problem and do it in a, in a way that says, you know, all of us have a little bit of the answer to that problem. You know, uh, <laughs> Michael and I are getting older so we've been doing this for a while. And um, uh, Mandar, you're still young as far as I'm concerned, but, um, but I think that those of us who have taught in the classroom, done, gone through that whole experience, need to really think about how, I'm thinking increasingly of what message can I leave behind? What structure can I build that'll last beyond my life mm -hmm. and uh, you know and the fact that i'm living in silicon valley 
means that I, I need to create structures, online courses, you know, things, things that educational resources, things that will be here in 30, 40, 50 years and that other people can use to, uh, to carry out this world house education. Um, to me, that's the great need of our time is how do we, how do, how do we encapsulate the knowledge that comes from Gandhi and King and, and other people who have contributed to this great tradition? How can we uh, build uh, educational programs that make sense to, to people? And I, I'll just end on this. Uh, it's, it's, also, it's also important that we face this question of when the human rights ideals were articulated back in the Enlightenment, one of the results of that is that they developed the notion that the nation was going to be the tool to bring about human rights. You know, that's why we have a Declaration of Independence and the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. You know, there was this, this notion that somehow the nation state was, was going to be an effective tool for human rights. We have several hundred years of experience that says that that was a misconception. Nation states have a lot more priority, other priorities other than human rights. Uh, they base, basically exist to preserve themselves. And so, I mean, among the lessons we have to learn is how to move beyond nationalism, how, how to learn, you know, as King put it, uh, our, our loyalties have to be ecumenical. You know, we have to find some way of having a sense that our purpose on earth is not to build a nation, but to build human rights throughout the world. And that's a different project. And sometimes you're going to have to take on the nation in order to do that. And you have to move beyond patriotism and loyalty to a nation. And I think that that's a difficult message for our time. You know, we, we see what happens to people who uh, don't have that, that sense of, of nationalism. You, know, you can't run for president like that. <laughs> so, hey, uh, I have uh, I have a point of view here. I think yes. what is uh, what is the need of the hour is an education that promotes human values. Exactly, and the human values transcend any barrier of let's say caste, culture, religion, nationality. What are those human values that are universal principles of unconditional love, mutual respect, not just tolerance, mutual respect, uh, compassion service. So education that stimulates your heart. I think that is what modern technology can also do is through experiential education. And uh, you know, that is uh, in a way we have to go to the media because this is a media tool. Uh, and like Michael said in the beginning, nonviolence is a philosophy. It's a state of mind that needs to percolate beyond just resistance. It needs to be in every aspect of life, business, you know, uh, religion, churches. So nonviolence is, is, uh, is, is fully unconditionally loving. And that I would say is the need of the hour. That bridges all the concerns you have. And I don't think you have not left a legacy already. You have already left a legacy because if I put myself in the shoes of four years ago when I was having this dream of, hey, let's make a journey in my one month holiday. The place where I went was the King Center Library because that is the place where I found everything that I didn't know about. I didn't know about MLK's journey to India. You have an archive. I didn't know about MLK's speeches. You have an archive. So I think uh, we need to just build on this and modern technology allows it. And uh, I think human values education is uh, what my film is also gearing towards. So curriculums that encourage people to see the commonality that you may be white, I may be black and brown, but our struggles are the same. 
our trauma is the same. The source of trauma may be different. And that is where, you know, the wisdom of India is pain is inevitable. When there is life, there is pain. Suffering is optional. To suffer or not is an option, is an option I choose. And so today, like what uh, Michael was saying, mirror neurons, like all these scientific discoveries of meditation, that needs to be included in every curriculum because it, it transcends boundaries. To sit still, to be idle, to do yoga, you don't need to follow uh, a specific religion because all these things transcend religion. It makes you more human. It makes you more connected. And I think once you are raised in consciousness, everything else will happen on its own. Because when you are a higher conscious human being, you will accept, you will, you know, do what is needed. Uh, that's, I would say, the wisdom of India is how to raise your consciousness. Uh, through various different methodologies, the four methodologies that uh, Michael in, uh, in, uh, enumerated, uh, breathing, meditation, exercises, simplest methodology, because you're doing it anyway. Mandar, can I just interrupt and say, um, I haven't been the best of a facilitator here because we have some questions uh, for, from people who have been on um, this webinar. And so I'm going to insert them right now. And we have very few minutes left uh, in this session. I have a feeling we could go on uh, quite much longer than this. But um, there is an Atlanta resident um, and a participant in five civil disobedient actions regarding the death penalty. I and others sadly have watched the MLK Center for Nonviolence fade away from doing and promoting nonviolence research, training, and uh, promoting nonviolence. Any of you know if and when this will turn around? So um, that's an open question. I, I suppose we're talking about the King Center in Atlanta. I believe so. I hope they're not talking about the King Institute at Stanford, but um, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no I, I, I think that um, the the King Center in Atlanta has. Uh, you know, I obviously I worked, I worked there back when uh, Coretta Scott King was the was the president. I had an office there, um, and. Uh, you know, I, I think that maybe what they're referring to is back in that day, there were many programs um, coming out of the King Center, uh, summer programs. I, I remember coming down and uh, young people from all over the world would come there every summer. And uh, that kind of vigorous uh, programming, you know, it takes, takes a lot of resources to do that. And quite frankly, today's King Center doesn't have those, those kinds of resources. Um, one of the things about uh, uh, Coretta King that I, I think most people don't realize is that she was an enormously effective leader who raised a great deal of money. Um, and that's something that we can't take for granted. Not everybody can do that. And um, <laughs> you know, one, of, one of the things that, that was true about her is that she raised more money than the organization that uh, uh, Martin Luther King started, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Um, and so she was able to, to launch a number of educational programs, including the King Papers Project, and that have had an enormous impact on the world. But sustaining that, uh, sustaining those kinds of organizations is a tremendous um, burden. You know, sustaining the King Institute is, I'm already worried about whether, how well it will survive after my retirement uh, later this year. Uh, you know, we, the only thing that survives in, an, in a university is an endowment. And um, we have a fairly small endowment. So it's, it's always a question. And that's why I think for uh, Michael with uh, the Meta Center, I'm sure that you're thinking about 
how that institution is going to survive into the future and Mandar with, with what you've created. Um, you know, all of us are mortal. We have to, we have to create hopefully things that will survive us. And, um, but that's a, that's a responsibility that everyone has to take on. And I think we also have to think about maybe refashioning what it means to build an institute. Because sometimes institutes are like nations. They are structures that, that I think, the, I think we're over, huh? No, 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 we're not over. Sorry, you cut out there, Clay. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, I, uh, I hope that thought got across. That I, I think it did. And we are um, at the top of the hour, but we have one more question that I think, uh, if you wouldn't mind staying on, and if our audience needs to go, <laughs> we totally understand that. But um, the question uh, is, um, it's a big one, but um, you know I'm sure that we can condense the answer and uh, maybe continue it uh, through writing back and forth. Uh, the role of church women in guiding the values of the out front leaders in the civil rights movement. Uh, can you address that? Uh, power uh, differentiates, uh, differentials were present. How can we lift up the relationship discipline practices that the women were guiding behind the scenes. Uh, Marilyn, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm part of an organization called the Shanti Sena Network, mm -hmm. which is your training intervention. And they're having a call right now that I am oh, okay. supposed to be on. Also, Clay would be much, much better at answering that question. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for, so, for helping yeah. us on this webinar. We're most grateful. Good to talk to you, Michael, as always. As always, Clay, take care. Before Nandar. you leave, Michael, can you do a plug-in for your own book and when we can look at it? And, uh, yeah, the, the third harmony is uh, we have advanced copies in our office, but you can uh, pre-order it at Amazon and that helps to build sales and that gets to the question that Clay was just raising. How do we get the money to continue the organization? So we, I've just been reading it very carefully with Stephanie and, and others and I, and I do think it is after all a worthwhile book. Right. So write to us at the center or pre-order it at Amazon. And we'll make certain we put it in the report when it goes out. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Bye mm -hmm. for now. Bye. Uh, so getting back to that question, mm -hmm. um, would you rephrase it? I, I'm sure. It says, can you ask the panel how they see the role of the church women in guiding the oh, values okay. of yeah, the I, out front I, leaders in the civil I, rights I would, movement? I would generalize from that. One of the reasons why I'm working on a book called Coretta and Martin right now is that I think that it's not just the Coretta story. It's the story of a huge number of women who played behind the scenes roles in what we call the civil rights movement, which I, I don't like that term because it assumes that something started and ended. But, um, but when I look at Coretta, she was an activist before she met Martin. She, she was someone who was at the Progressive Party Convention in 1948. She was a pacifist. She was an civil rights activists uh, before she even met Mark. So to me, one of the problems of what that we faced in the 1950s and 60s is that we underutilize the power of women like Coretta. You know, that um, that, that was just a, a structural problem in our society, you know, that that women were expected to defer their careers. Uh, you know, Martin wanted her to stay at home and raise kids. And, uh, you know, that was, that was not something unique to him. It was something that uh, Gandhi had uh, some definite problems along those lines, uh, putting the priority on his career as opposed to uh, his wife and, uh, and, and his children. And so, so I think that 
that that's one of the reasons why when we tell the story of the black freedom struggle, we're also telling the story of women's liberation. That as a necessary component of that struggle, other kinds of liberation always take place within a liberation struggle. That you begin to understand that to maximize the power of people, you have to look at people differently. You have to say, you know, this, this person can do more uh, if we freed them from the expectations of society. Um, Greta is a good example. You know, sometimes we look, oh, she's a child. Well, you know, she's done more than any adult I can think of to bring attention to the problems of our environment. And when we look at, at the freedom struggles that took place in the 60s, the teenagers who preceded Rosa Parks, the teenagers who launched the sit-ins, the teenagers who mm -hmm. uh, made it possible for King to win his greatest victory in Birmingham, these are kids. So we have to start rethinking you know, when we think about people power, people come in all sizes and all ages and, you know, all um, characteristics. And part of what we need to do if we are going to liberate the world is understand that uh, we have to, we have to see them in, in a different light. We have to see their potential as people who can bring about change. We have to sometimes listen to them you know, and uh, take seriously what they say. You know, I, I think that, that that is one of the, the great needs and that's why, as I said, education really has to start with child rearing. You know, how, can we, how can we raise children in a way that makes them uh, capable of living in the world house and and experts at that more expert than we are so uh so it's it's a big challenge and and i think the most important part of the challenge is is getting uh yeah, getting through that it takes all on board you know if you yeah. if you're Trying to, trying to achieve a goal and you have a limited number of people, you have to maximize the capabilities of everyone. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I'm most grateful for a number of things that uh, Michael and Clay Mundar shared. Um, I think you've given a new challenge to the Charter for Compassion. Um, you know, the reminder of the of King's World House, um, a reminder of Miles Horton and the Highlander Center and all of the incredible work that went on there, uh, the Mississippi Freedom Schools. Um, these were, you know, such important parts of our history um, that so many people don't know about. And, um, you know, we're always told that uh, if, if we're good students of history, uh, we can find out a lot so that we don't have to repeat mistakes. Um, and I think you've offered some incredible challenges uh, to us today. And I hope that uh, you would be open if we knocked on all of your doors again um, to kind of help uh, kind of what reframe uh, some of the, the efforts that we're all um, doing and you know, build that network and build that collaboration. So I'm most grateful for everything um, that you've done uh, and certainly that you're doing um, in all cases. And, and I remember that Martin Luther King, I believe said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice anywhere. Um, so it's the challenge that, that he gave to all of us. Um, and I thank you for helping to move forward with us. 
it's wonderful talking to you, Marilyn and, and Mandar. Uh, we need to get back together. Um, I, I, I think that getting together on, through technology is one thing, seeing you in person. Uh, so Marilyn, come up, to, come up to Stanford and visit. I will. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mandar. Thanks, everyone. And we'll be sending out a report uh, along with the link to this recording.